This is Lois Whaley for Women Today and Yesterday. I'm uh, speaking again on the history of women's suffrage because coming up next week, August 26th, is Women's Equality Day, which celebrates the passage in 1920 of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving women citizens in the, the United States the right to vote. That's quite a long time ago now, of course. Uh, it won't be too long until we get to that centennial in 2020. But right now we're in 2014, and I'm going to be uh, speaking about history of women's suffrage. I want to point out my uh, t-shirt that I'm wearing here. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of it can be seen. Let me move this book out of the way for a minute. Yes, it shows two women um, in profile here uh, with a uh, torch or perhaps a flaming chalice from the Unitarian Universalist tradition because um, this uh, t-shirt was something that I got, oh, about 15 years ago, I guess, from the Unitarian Universalist Women's Heritage Society. Um, and it has a, an important message on it, which says, take from the past, not its ashes, but its fire. And so that's what I hope that uh, we'll be discussing today, the fire of uh, the women's rights movement, specifically since uh, 1848 in the United States. It was in 1848 that uh, a meeting was called in July, which I spoke about last time, uh, July 19th and 20th, 1848. There was a convention in Seneca Falls, New York, a little um, place. It was small in those days, and it's still pretty small, but it's on Seneca Lake. Uh, not too far uh, from uh, Cornell University, actually. And uh, the uh, National Women's Hall of Fame is there today, as I mentioned last week. It was uh, in Seneca Falls in 1848 that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the prime uh, author of a Declaration of Sentiments, which drew uh, heavily upon the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence of 1776 to um, put forth the arguments why women should have more rights. And um, so what I'm going to do is to read from the Declaration of Sentiments um, her points. Following the Declaration of Independence, she speaks about um, things, 18 points, I guess there were 18 points in the original Declaration of Independence against uh, King George III and why he should uh, be uh, revolted against by the American revolutionaries. And uh, this is uh, going to be 18 points that men have done uh, as a class against women as of 1848. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. First of the 18 points. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise, in other words, the right to vote. He has withheld from her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both native and foreigners. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice because no vote. Having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, 
He has oppressed her on all sides. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. That is to say, uh, women were covered by the um, citizenship of their husbands once they were married. He has taken from her all right and property, even to the wages she earns. He has made her, morally, an irresponsible being as she can commit many crimes with impunity, provided they be done in the presence of her husband. In the covenant of marriage, she is compelled to promise obedience to her husband, he becoming, to all intents and purposes, her master, the law giving him power to deprive her of her liberty and to administer chastisement. You remember last week I mentioned the uh, law someplace that said that a husband could beat his wife if he used a stick that wasn't any bigger around than his thumb. He has so framed the laws of divorce as to what shall be the proper causes, and in case of separation, to whom the guardianship of the children shall be given, as to be wholly regardless of the happiness of women. The law in all cases, going upon a false supposition of the supremacy of man and giving all power into his hands. In other words, if there was divorce, the, um, the fathers would have custody. After depriving her of all rights as a married woman, if single, and the owner of property, he has taxed her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it by taxes. He has monopolized nearly all the profitable employments, and from those she is permitted to follow, she receives but a scanty remuneration. He closes against her all the avenues to wealth and distinction, which he considers most honorable to himself. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. Remember, we're talking about 1848. Now, here's a, a point which is a, little, um, which is a little not correct. It says here, he has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education, all colleges being closed against her. Actually, in 1848, uh, Oberlin College, in northern Ohio admitted both uh, women and uh, black persons. But it was about the only one at that time that admitted women. He allows her in church as well as state, but a subordinate position claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry and with some exceptions from any public participation in the affairs of the church. He has created a false public sentiment by giving to the world a different code of morals for men and women, by which moral delinquencies, which exclude women from society, are not only tolerated, but deemed of little account in men. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign for her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and to her God. And finally, he has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. So, from the Declaration of Sentiments um, by Elizabeth Cady Stanton in July 1848. Those 18 points that she says that men have denied women rights. And it was, for the most part, uh, very true across the United States at that time. This is from my book here called Women's America, which is a book of history of uh, women in the United States. Well, 
1848 was that first uh, women's rights conference in Seneca Falls, New York. But it was uh, quickly followed up by uh, some more women's rights conferences. In fact, I believe there was one in nearby Rochester, New York, just within a month of the one in Seneca Falls. And as far as Ohio was concerned, in 1850 was the first women's rights conference in Ohio. I have here uh, a tote bag that I got in the year 2000, which was the sesquicentennial, in other words, the 150th anniversary of the first Ohio Women's Rights Conference held in the little town of Salem, not very far from uh, Kent State University, Canton and Akron, uh, but closer to the border with uh, Pennsylvania, um, in 1850 it was held. And that was a very interesting conference for me to go and uh, hear about the first women's rights conference uh, in Ohio. And uh, interestingly enough, there were a number of women who were active in uh, women's rights in the 19th century after Seneca Falls and after the Salem Conference who um, were active in the state of Ohio. So I'm going to be speaking about uh, several of those uh, women. The first one I want to mention is uh, Antoinette Brown Blackwell. Now she was born in New York, but she was an early graduate of Oberlin College, which of course, as I mentioned before, and as you know, is in northern Ohio, almost directly north of us here, um, very close to Lake Erie, Oberlin, Ohio. Antoinette Brown um, was a graduate in 1850. And uh, she is notable for being the first woman who was um, called by a congregation to be its minister. And that was, um, she graduated in 1850, and uh, it was in, in 1853, I believe, that she became the settled minister in a little town in New York State of the Congregational Denomination. So she was the uh, first uh, settled woman minister in uh, the U.S. But of course, women had uh, preached before, and in fact, Antoinette Brown herself had preached during the years that she was a student at Oberlin. Uh, in fact, that was an important part of the theological education that she took uh, at Oberlin. However, she was not permitted to get, although she finished the course uh, for the uh, theology for ministry, she was not permitted to get a degree in theology uh, from Oberlin at the time because she was a woman. And it was not until a number of years later and after she had been a minister at a number of different places that uh, she actually was given a degree from Oberlin for the theology a course that she completed in 1850. I think it was about 1870 when she was finally officially recognized. Now, um, she was a friend at Oberlin of a woman named Lucy Stone. And uh, Lucy Stone married uh, Henry Blackwell. She was um, uh, also very interested in uh, women's rights, Lucy Stone Blackwell. And um, she um, introduced her friend, Antoinette Brown, to uh, her husband Henry's brother, Samuel Blackwell. And uh, they were married, Antoinette Brown married uh, Samuel Blackwell in uh, 1856. She was, as I say, uh, at that time, um, 
um, recognized minister, not uh, formally particularly recognized, but she did um, service several churches, including this first one in 1853 in New York State. Now, of course, after women uh, marry, they frequently have children, and especially back in the days before contraception, uh, Antoinette, Antoinette Brown Blackwell became the mother of eight children, five of whom lived to grow up, because in those days, uh, um, infant mortality and the mortality of young children was all uh, too frequent. But anyway, um, she, Antoinette Brown Blackwell eventually moved from the Congregational Church, I think because uh, the Congregational Church at the time, at least where she was, was not very favorable to abolition of slavery. And this was in the 1850s. And Antoinette Brown Blackwell was a friend of uh, well-known abolitionists. And um, so she became eventually a Unitarian minister. And actually, at the end of her life, she served in Elizabeth, New Jersey for 17 years. Now, one of the interesting things about Antoinette Brown Blackwell was that although she was born in 1825, she lived a very long life. And she was one of the few women who, was very, who were very active suffragists um, in the 1850s, 60s, and so on, who, was, who lived long enough to actually vote um, in because she lived until 1921. When she was a woman in her 90s, she voted for the first time after the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So Antoinette Brown Blackwell, one of the interesting women associated in a sense with Ohio because of her um, her living in Oberlin for four years and getting uh, two degrees, actually. Well, the first one she got for a more general education course. The theology one was denied her until 1870. Well, let's see. Here's someone else who was uh, involved with uh, woman suffrage and also was a pioneer minister, a universalist, actually, of the Unitarian Universalist group. Now, she was actually born in Michigan, in a log cabin, they say. But she attended college in uh, Ohio, not at Oberlin, but at Antioch College in Yellow Springs. And she was at Antioch College uh, in the um, 1850s, the late 1850s. I believe she got her degree from Antioch in 1860. And then she went right on. This is her name is Olympia Brown. Olympia Brown went right on to attend a theological um, college where she was a graduate student. And this was in Canton, Canton, New York, this theological college for universalist ministers, uh, primarily. And uh, she attended this uh, theological college, got a degree in 1863, and was ordained then as a universalist uh, minister. She uh, had a sp very special interest in woman's suffrage. And in fact, uh, for much of her life, she served as uh, the head of suffrage association. I believe that she was the founder of the New England Woman's Suffrage Association. Uh, probably this would, would have been just after the Civil War that uh, she did that. 
And uh, she was a person who lived again for a very long time. She was one of the women who was able to vote for um, President of the United States in 1920. And perhaps she also voted in 1924 because she lived until 1926. She was born in 1835. So uh, she was a woman over 90 when she died, and that was in 1926. But uh, she was quite interested in the whole question of woman's suffrage and uh, worked actively at it. But she also was a universalist minister for a number of years, and the first one that was sort of right away ordained um, after she finished theological school at the Universalist Church in Canton, New York. So um, it's an, an interesting thing um, that she was uh, one of these pioneer women's rights activists. She was such a pioneer that in the teens of uh, the early teens, you know, like 1913, 14, 15, when they were having women's rights parades in New York City and so on. She was in her 80s then, but she was one of the people who marched in those parades. And um, she, she uh, was also a member of the Women's Party, which was founded by Alice Paul. And so Olympia Brown became a proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment the Equal Rights Amendment was an effort begun by Alice Paul and the Women's uh, Rights Party to um, put into the U.S. Constitution the Equal Rights Amendment. The older people in the audience will remember that there was quite a, um, an effort back in the 1970s to put the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. However, in 1982, the Equal Rights Amendment uh, expired. That is to say, unlike some of the other constitutional amendments that were proposed and later passed, there was a time limit put on the Equal Rights Amendment. It had to get 37 votes um, before July 1st, 1982, in order to become a part of the U.S. Constitution. And it only got to 30, 35, so it expired on July 1st, 1982, a day which I remember well because uh, that was the day we had a rally um, for the first day after the expiration of the Equal Rights Amendment on July 1st, 1982. And it was quite an interesting um, e event. Perhaps I'll show you a picture of it sometime. That was in the July 2nd um, Messenger, full page, front page picture, which actually shows me at a microphone standing on one of those, um, not the steps, but one of those um, little platformy like things on the Athens County Courthouse with a, um, uh, you know, means of projecting my voice electronically. Uh, we had uh, some property which had been lent us by um, WATH, actually, uh, for the occasion. However, after we had uh, started our uh, program and we had 10 women lined up to speak about equal rights, um, the sheriff uh, turned us out. Why? Because there had been calls to the courthouse uh, threatening arson. And as a matter of fact, it was later said that there had been several small fires at the courthouse in the preceding days. Now, whether that had something to do with our event on the Equal Rights uh, Amendment, or whether it had something to do with the trial that was going on at the time of Claire Ball Sr., Athens Township trustee, who was uh, on trial for um, having township trustees work on some of his private stuff. 
we'll never know. But we were shut down and we had to go to the um, to College Green and to the Civil War Monument to finish our program, which of course was pretty tough when we had to leave our uh, equipment back at the courthouse. Anyway, maybe that's another story. <laughs> but I think it's quite uh, apparent that there were some people who were still very adamant for the Equal Rights Amendment and very adamant against the Equal Rights Amendment in July of 1982 when uh, that event occurred. Well, um, back to some of this 19th century history. I was speaking about Olympia Brown and uh, her, her uh, fact that she was able to vote in uh, 1920 and 1924, perhaps. Another uh, woman who um, lived long enough to vote was Phoebe Coffin Hannaford, who was uh, proposed for a universalist ministry and encouraged, actually, by Olympia Brown and became a universalist minister in New England. And uh, Phoebe Hannaford, lived until 1921. Uh, she was um, over 90 years old at the time, but she was able to vote in 1920. So there were a few who were able to, to get by and get through that. Well, um, Hannaford didn't have any particular connection with Ohio, but now I want to talk about a woman who did. And uh, she's one that I'm a specialist on, you might say. She's a Southeast Ohio native. She was born to one of the pioneer families, the Barkers, who were um, living in uh, Marietta, among the very first pioneer families, the Barkers and the Danas. And her name was Frances Dana Gage. Her middle name was uh, Dana. She was Frances Dana Barker uh, as a young woman. She was born in 1808 uh, in Marietta, one of the youngest children, perhaps the youngest in that Barker family, who incidentally, if I uh, read the, um, the history of Athens County correctly, uh, some of the Barkers and possibly even her grandfather were among the Barkers who were early um, citizens living here in Athens, Ohio, after it was founded, which of course was 1797. And the Barkers, um, some of those Barkers moved to Athens County. And uh, later, uh, one of the Barkers, I think her, the uncle of Francis Dana Gage, was um, served Athens County as uh, in the Ohio legislature in the 18, about 1818, I guess. So there's a connection with, with Athens itself. Frances Dana Gage uh, grew up and um, married uh, James Gage of McConnellsville, which is not very far away, as you know, uh, just in our neighboring county there and on the Muskingum River with um, the two towns, McConnellsville and Malta, across the river from each other, um, I believe. And um, so Frances Dana Gage lived for quite a long time in McConnellsville, where her husband was both a lawyer and uh, had an iron manufacturing uh, business. Gage was a woman who um, had a, what she called the triune cause the triune cause, three things that she was particularly interested in working on. And the three things were abolition of slavery, temperance because of the um, problems that heavy drink especially gave to women who were under the authority of men and often the men would, you know, drink up the wages, not only of themselves but also if their wife happened to be employed the wife's wages as well during the days when uh, women could not 
did not have the right to their own wages, but their husbands had the rights to the wages. So uh, those were two of her three causes, abolition of slavery, temperance, and uh, the third one was women's rights. Now, um, Frances Dana Gage happened to be the person in charge at the 1851, which was the second Ohio uh, Women's Rights Conference in 1851, held in Akron, uh, in the spring. Uh, she was by that time a well-known person, in spite of the fact that she had eight children. She uh, did a lot of reading, a lot of writing. She was at that time, I believe, already writing uh, as Aunt Fanny, that was her nom de plume, um, for the Ohio cultivator uh, in Columbus. And uh, she was the chair of this meeting in Akron in the spring of 1851, Second Women's Rights Conference. And um, the women were having a kind of a tough time. There were a lot of men there, and they were being um, preached to by men who said, women are not supposed to speak. It says so in the Bible. St. Paul said so. Women shouldn't be speaking at all. Well, among the people who uh, had come to that conference was the itinerant preacher Sojourner Truth, a black woman um, who had been a slave in New York State. She was not a Southern black. In fact, her first language was Dutch because she grew up in the Hudson Valley. But um, she had, of course, benefited from the abolition of slavery in New York State in 1827. And um, she had become a preacher and taken the name of Sojourner Truth uh, during her preaching. And in 1851, she showed up in Akron at this women's rights convention, the second one that was held. And she asked to speak. <laughs> so Frances Dana Gage um, said, okay, you know, come on up to the podium and, and say whatever it is you have to say. She gave a speech that, well, there's no exact rendering of it. There are several uh, um, versions one of the versions was written up by Frances Dana Gage herself and published in the History of Woman Suffrage when it was published in the 1880s. Um, so her account of what Sojourner Truth had to say was rather different from an account that was given at the time. But uh, she emphasized the fact that she was a, uh, this is Sojourner Truth, emphasized the fact that she was a very big, strong woman. Um, they say she was six feet tall, someone who was uh, really, uh, you couldn't miss her if you ever saw her, Sojourner Truth. And um, she spoke, one of the things that Frances Dana Gage says that she said was, ain't I a woman? But look at my arm, you know, how strong it is. Of course, I don't have the muscles that uh, Sojourner Truth had. And there are later people who uh, take a, a, an earlier version of what she said that ain't I a woman was not one of the things she said. <laughs> well, who knows? Anyway, she certainly made the point that she was a very strong person and had worked hard all her life, had had children and so on. And, uh, ate as much as a man if she could get it, and, and so forth, and that she'd been a slave and was now uh, a free black because she had been, um, slavery had been abolished in New York State, where she was from. Well, anyway, uh, Sojourner Truth has become one of the uh, popular heroines of uh, the women's rights movement, particularly for that 1851 speech that she gave that has been written up for history, not only by a man who was present uh, at the time in 1851, but also by Frances Dana Gage, our uh, women's rights advocate from Southeast Ohio. And incidentally, at Ohio University in the um, 
place where they keep the dissertations and theses, there is a thesis that was uh, written up, oh, about 20 years ago. I'm trying to remember, I think the name of the woman was Pearl Cantrell. She was a um, student of history who was, uh, who did, uh, uh, wrote a thesis, a whole thesis on the life of Francis Dana Gage. And that thesis is available at the Ohio University um, well, archives or wherever it is that they keep the, the uh, theses that uh, have been written by uh, students at Ohio University. Pearl Contrell got this uh, master's degree in history as a result of her, her write-up of the life of Frances Dana Gage. So there is a, another connection that we have with Ohio and uh, women's rights and women's rights uh, as, as uh, promoted uh, in the 1851st Salem Convention and then in 1851 the Akron Convention where Sojourner Truth spoke and that was uh, presided over by Frances Dana Gage. Well, um, one of the things that Francis Dana Gage did was to uh, write up a, uh, she, she was a poet. She wrote both poetry and uh, fiction and nonfiction, and, and she was a speaker. Um, like I say, she was called Aunt Fanny. And in 1852, she was uh, one of the, uh, she, I think she was also active in an 1852 women's rights convention. She was asked at that time to write a poem about women's rights by um, the Hutchinson Singers. These were some people in New England who were uh, made a living by going around and um, singing songs and reading poetry at women's rights meetings. I'm sure they did other things as well, but one of the things they did was to ask Frances Dana Gage to uh, write a poem for them, and she did. And so, of course, I should read you this poem. It's <laughs> it will strike you as rather humorous, I think, in a way, but she had a great faith. This was in 1852 that she wrote this poem. She had a great faith that women's rights and abolition of slavery would occur and also temperance would be followed 100 years hence. In other words, that would have been 1952. Well, those of you who are old enough to remember 1952 as I am will find some of this rather humorous. On the other hand, she did prove to be somewhat of a prophet. This is called a hundred years hence, and it was written by Francis Dana Gage in 1852. And one of the uh, important things, which is not generally known perhaps about women's history, is that in 1876, at the time of the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, the uh, women were not invited to come to the uh, big celebration that the men put on in Philadelphia for the centennial of the Declaration of Independence. So the women organized their own celebration a couple of blocks away from Independence Hall. Now quite a few women were there and the Hutchinson Singers were there and the Hutchinson Singers closed that uh, celebration of 1876, the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, by singing Francis Dana Gage's song, 100 Years Hence, written in 1852. And I'm going to read it for you. 100 years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade, in statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence. These things will be altered a hundred years hence. Our laws then will be uncompulsory rules. Our prisons 
converted to national schools. The pleasure of sinning, tis all a pretense, and people will find that a hundred years hence. All cheating and fraud will be laid on the shelf. Men will not get drunk, nor be bound up in self. But all live together, good neighbors and friends, as Christian folks ought to, a hundred years hence. Then woman, man's partner, man's equal shall stand, while beauty and harmony govern the land. To think for oneself will be no offense. The world will be thinking a hundred years hence, Oppression and war will be heard of no more, nor blood of a slave leave his print on our shore. Conventions will then be a useless expense, for we'll go free suffrage a hundred years hence. Instead of speech-making to satisfy wrong, we'll all join the chorus to sing freedom's song. And if the millennium is not a pretense. We'll all be good brothers a hundred years hence. Or perhaps we'll all be good brothers and sisters a hundred years hence. Well, as I say, that's some of what she said came true and some of what she said certainly didn't come true. There are plenty of people who are getting drunk <laughs> and so on. And there is certainly still uh, pretty much of a double standard for men and women um, in terms of morals. Women expected to be a lot better than men and sort of accepted that, you know, boys will be boys and, and that sort of thing. But um, that was, again, Francis Dana Gage's 1852 poem, which the Hutchinson set to music. I can sing it, and we did sing it at the first um, uh, women's conference that we held for International Women's Day uh, six years ago now. But uh, I'm not going to try to um, actually sing it for you, but uh, this, as you can perhaps tell, does have music to it. And it is in one of the Unitarian hymnals. Um, a Hundred Years Hence, by Francis Dana Gage. Well, um, while we're talking again about uh, women's rights and uh, connections with Ohio, I want to mention once again something which I've mentioned before, and that is the um, plaque to Susan B. Anthony which uh, is to be found on Memorial Auditorium, you know, on the side toward College Green, where they have uh, bronze plaques to a number of famous men and women, but not too many women until 1995. There was only one woman um, who had a plaque on the uh, Memorial Auditorium and that was for Eleanor Roosevelt, who spoke at Ohio University. I'm not sure exactly when, but I think in the um, late 1940s or in the 1950s, when she was doing a lot of speaking around the country for uh, various causes. And probably after she had finished her term, uh, at the United Nations where she was the uh, chair of the um, Human Rights Convention and uh, helped to um, write up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 of the, the United Nations. But in 1995, in honor of the 75th anniversary of woman suffrage, of uh, becoming a part of the U.S. Constitution in 1920. In other words, 75 years after uh, the passage of the 19th Amendment, a new plaque was uh, added to um, 
the ones that are on the memorial auditorium side. And that was a plaque commemorating the visit in 1878, in October of 1878, Susan B. Anthony, who probably spoke at what is today uh, City Hall, uh, because City Hall was, was built in 1868, 10 years before uh, Susan B. Anthony visited, and that was long before there was uh, any memorial auditorium, of course, or uh, any really large uh, place where people could gather uh, to hear. They, they had an opera house on the second floor of City Hall in those days, and so it was a place with a number of chairs where speakers could speak. And so it's thought that probably Susan B. Anthony spoke at City Hall in 1878 when she visited Athens. So there's another connection between us here in Athens and uh, the women's rights people of um, that early day in the 19th century. Well, um, about Susan B. Anthony, she was a born a Quaker and uh, in Massachusetts. Then she moved to New York State when she was a young girl to a little tiny town called Battenville, and I have mentioned before, uh, perhaps it's getting uh, time worn for me to mention again, that my grandfather, Elmer Ellsworth Hatch, was born in that very little village called Battenville, New York, in Washington County, northern, sort of central New York, along near the, the Hudson River, but on the Batten Kill, which is one of the early tributaries of the Hudson River. And what is more, he was born on February 15th, namely the birthday of Susan B. Anthony, who of course by then had long since moved to Rochester and was considerably older since she was born in 1820 and my grandfather was born in 1863. She would have been uh, 43 years old on the day that my grandfather was born. But this is one of the interesting things that you can find, uh, interesting coincidences uh, when you study history and begin looking closely at dates and places and times, which is one of the things I really enjoy very much doing. So um, let's see, I guess I should mention one more woman because of connections again with Ohio and Ohio University in a sense. And that woman is the one that in 2011 I proposed for the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame. Her name was Frances Ellen Watkins Harper and she was born a free black woman in 1825, well, free black female baby in 1825, and she lived till 1911. Um, she had to move away from uh, Maryland uh, after Maryland began seizing free blacks in, well, people in Maryland uh, began seizing free blacks and selling them into slavery in the South after the passage of the um, law which said that uh, black people could be um, sold into slavery even if they were free people. So Maryland said, okay, either leave the state or if you aren't careful, maybe somebody will catch you and shall sell you into slavery. That was after about 1850 when that law was passed. So Frances Selen Watkins in those days um, was associated with the state of Maine and the abolition of speaking in the state of Maine. She wrote a book of poetry in 1854, which uh, would have been, uh, you know, about the time just before she was uh, 30 years old, and uh, she also spoke in Ohio and throughout the north, northeast, you might say, and um, she was uh, for a time 
a teacher, a teacher of sewing actually, uh, in uh, uh, what later became part of uh, Wilberforce University, uh, which is traditionally black school over in the western part of the state. And uh, she taught there for about a year at least, as far as we know. And then eventually, actually in 1860, she married an Ohio uh, black man who had a little farm near Columbus, and his name was Harper. So she's Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, and she was well known in the 19th century as an author of poetry, especially poetry, but also she was credited with being one of the first authors uh, published who was a black woman for a um, uh, short story, and then later one of the very first novels by a black woman, her novel called Liola Leroy. And uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, during the Civil War, was living in Ohio on a farm near Columbus, where she was, you know, basically a farm wife, essentially. Um, she had a daughter, but her husband died in 1864, and she soon lost the farm, was uh, perhaps, uh, you know, taken up by a, a bank or something for um, not having the mortgage paid, who knows. But she lived for a number of years in Ohio, so she's a genuine um, person from Ohio and associated with Ohio. And I'm very proud that I nominated her for the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame, and she was um, inducted in 19, tw pardon me, 2011. She was inducted in 2011 into the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame. And the induction, um, well, I'm not exactly what you'd call it. It's not really a plaque, but it's a little uh, thing made of glass, crystal, and it has engraved on it her name, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, uh, that she was inducted into the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame in 2011. And uh, that uh, is still over at the Women's Center in Baker Center. I believe with the Women's Center is closed uh, at this time because of summer vacation, but after the um, school takes up again and Ohio University opens, uh, Baker Center will be open and uh, you could even take a look at the commemorative um, <laughs> plaque or whatever to Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Um, a true Ohioan, although she lived many other places uh, during her long life, she uh, ended her days in Philadelphia, actually. Um, and I remember visiting a Unitarian church in Philadelphia of which she had been uh, a member as an, an old lady. Well, those are some of the pioneer women of, uh, with associations with Ohio and with women's rights um, across the 19th century, um, beginning with Antoinette Brown Blackwell, the Congregational Minister who became a Unitarian minister uh, in her old age, and Olympia Brown, the Universalist uh, graduate who was a graduate of Antioch College, but then of a theological school in New York and the first Universalist women, woman settled minister in uh, New England somewhere. Phoebe uh, Hannaford, I mentioned briefly as someone who was uh, persuaded to become a Universalist minister by Olympia Brown. Then uh, Frances Dana Gage, our Southeast Ohio uh, woman, associated with, remembered particularly for being in charge of the um, meeting in Akron in 1851, where Sojourner Truth gave her famous Ain't I a Woman speech, 
Um, and uh, Susan B. Anthony, whose plaque we can see on College Green if we want to go over there and take a look. And you know, um, three more women were actually added to um, those plaques about, oh, it must be four years ago or so now. Um, so that there are currently five plaques which commemorate women who spoke in Athens, Ohio, at Ohio University or in nearby Athens uh, over the years, over the many years. One being Pearl Buck, who's a native of West Virginia, actually, our, our neighboring state, but famous for uh, her stories of, about China and who became a Nobel a literature winner um, in the 1930s. And um, so check out those plaques sometime when you're walking by in College Green and uh, cast an eye to the left and see all those plaques that are there on Memorial Auditorium, uh, Templeton Blackburn Memorial Auditorium, named Templeton Blackburn for the first male black graduate of Ohio University. And uh, uh, Blackburn, she, she had a different name. She had a maiden name when she attended Ohio University in the uh, about 1912 or, or so. But um, plenty of history around us that we can uh, check out all the time. And uh, this is Lois Whaley for women today and yesterday. <laughs>